Good morning, my friends. I'm so glad to see all your wonderful faces. This is going to be a really great edition of the Pure Blend. Um, we are really, really blessed to have Josh Smith with us from DCYF, um, Department of Children and Families, sir? No? I, I know what this is. I know what you do, but I don't think I have the acronym. Yes, we're Department of Children, Youth and Family, Youth and, family. and I'm a part of the Juvenile Rehabilitation Sector. Thank you, Josh. So I, um, I have a really uh, big piece of my heart that belongs to JVR and peer services within. And I'm really, really grateful and glad that Josh is here to see us today and talk to us a little bit about his amazing efforts and DCYF's amazing efforts with peer support um, and juvenile rehabilitation. So um, without further ado, put your hands together and welcome Josh. Thanks, Josh. Let's go. All right. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. I come to you from Eastern Washington. I'm on the road. It's a part of what I do. So um, I'll get into my introduction and then we'll kind of get into the work a little bit. So my name is Joshua Smith. Uh, as you heard before, I'm DCYF's peer support program specialist. And um, my position was actually uh, designed by the governor and his team, and they wanted to be sure that DCYF and our, our juvenile rehabilitation sector had individuals with lived experience, um, not only in the policy and the standards of practice, but but really in the, the, the workplace culture development, right? As we move forward in DCYF and, and juvenile rehabilitation, we want to find out uh, where we're missing the mark. We want to find out um, how do we get the data that really matters, right? Um, and, and what are we using as data, you know, when we're thinking about recidivism and things like that? So we, we are working diligently, right, to build advisory boards. We're working diligently to have uh, peer bridgers come into our system and really, really determine best practices, best policies, and ways to navigate this system as peers, right? And and how can we bring peerness into juvenile rehabilitation? So that's my my position. It was um I kind of brag about the governor part because it's kind of dope, right? Um our our state really wants peer support in our systems, right? Um so a little bit about me. I come to DCYF through non-traditional pathways um, of education and employment, right? And and when I say non-traditional I kind of use that term lightly depending on my audience because it could be totally traditional for us, right? Your perspective and your experience is yours. And um, it's just non-traditional for the cohort of, of people, my colleagues, the people that I work with, right? And so I get to describe how my, my lived experience in juvenile facilities really impelled me and guides me in my work today, right? It kind of let me know where I wanted to be, what work I wanted to do, and, and showed me a lot of the systemic problems that existed because I was so close to them, right? Um, so because of Washington State's awesome peer support uh, push and the governor's buy-in uh, and DCYS understanding of the need for that peer support in their systems, uh, I got chosen to do the, the wonderful work and connect with all of you beautiful people across the state and and really get into what is the work? How do we do the work? How do we bring the work to our youth? And, and how does that relate in data, right? How does that turn out in, in recidivism reports? And how does that um, reflect in, in the youth and our community's success rates? So um, what I will do is I will do a quick screen share Boom. Sorry, guys. I know, I know, I know. Emails, emails, emails. So we'll start here. Do we all see this peer support in JRDCYF? Wonderful. Now, this is my three-prong approach. Now, when we're doing any kind of work, we, we, we need to understand that there's that internal piece, right, which is going to be identifying best practices and procedures that will foster community and increase engagement. We're working with staff who have been doing this work for years and years and years. We're working with staff that are brand new to this work. We're working with staff that that are our gatekeepers to coming in and, 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 and working with our youth, right? And even raising our hands and, and making a change, right? So it's it really starts with that internal piece for us and discussing with staff, what is peer support, right? Uh, how do you envision as staff us supporting you and your residents. And, and that buy-in is huge. So that's that's 
key one, right? Um, the second piece is the peer bridgers. We have peer bridgers who are coming into our facilities and connecting with our youth at least 90 days pre-release and staying connected 120 days post-release. And that's really huge for us at DCYF because aftercare is, is a huge piece of that recidivism, right? How can we support you while you're out in the community, right? How can we stay connected while you're out in the community? And, and just to, me being frank, as an individual from juvenile justice settings, the day they let me out was the day I stopped talking to them. The day they let me out was the day I stopped reaching back. And, um, and I never got to really dive into the resources that were available to me. And, and in fact, it, it was likely because there wasn't an individual that I related to that could deliver that information to me, disseminate that information to me in a way that was culturally responsive, a way that I would pick it up and say, oh, right? And, and, and that's key to this peer support work that we're doing. Uh, we can all be peers, different angles and different lanes, but it's those lanes that give us those superpowers, right? So we have peer bridgers coming into the facilities, working with those in DCYF scare. And that starts with hiring practices, right? That starts with what are we doing with background checks? Like, how do we ensure that individuals with felonies like myself can get in the door and do the work, right? Uh, understanding that humans are born with you know, 316 bones, but adults only have 208. We change, period. As, as people, we develop, right? The, the prefrontal cortex isn't even matured until after 25. We change, right? So how do we add that to policy, right? How do we change the, the, the keep way that's happening within our systems? And it, it's been happening currently, they're bringing in individuals like us to say, hey, this is what I think matters. This is what I think counts. And, and we're implementing that in the hiring process. So we can have really dope peer bridgers connecting, um, making those connections, building those relationships and all of the above. So that peer bridger piece in our facilities, super, super important. And that brings me to my favorite part. You have a hand? I have a hand up. I have a question. Um, more of an embedded question. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that everybody here will entirely know what a peer bridger is. Josh, do you Ooh. think that you could let people know what, how peer bridgers, what they do and how they work specifically with JVR? I love it. I love it. Okay. So peer bridger, um, peer navigator, um, peer support specialist, right? These are all terms that, that are generally used for very similar positions, right? Now, in particular, our peer bridgers are bridging our youth to the resources, right? So if your agency delivers uh, DPT, right? Dialectic therapy, whatever, right? Our goal isn't to deliver that DBT skills ourselves, but to connect you guys to that, right? Our goal is not to give you the uh, uh, financial training, but to connect you to the proper people. Our goal is to not necessarily give you the housing resources, but connect you to that professional and say, this is Tim. This was why it worked so well for me. And I'll help you through that process or we'll work together through that process. I hate the word help, right? Um, but we work together. We're doing this life thing together. We're, we're, we're both in the same boat. We're on the same path. I just might be in a different space in the path than you. And uh, one way that I really like in those pathways is, is, like we're in the forest at night. We're all on our different pathways. But if I can shine light on my part of the pathway and you can shine light on your part of the pathway, soon enough, we have a, a lit up forest, right? We can see all around us, you know? So, so that's super important part of that process. Um, that peer bridger piece, connecting our youth with the resources that they might not be able to connect with because they're incarcerated, right? Um, and that's what our peer bridgers are. Is that, is that jive? Is that a little good? Did we land? wonderful uh that was wonderful benjamin wants to know um how that varies from being up here do you i i know i heard what you said about the incarceration piece being the big part where what the peer bridgers do um mm -hmm. is there i was just curious ben did he um did josh answer your question well enough um i've actually been confused about 
what the difference is in all the reading I've done and everything. I'm not really seeing uh, a specific difference between being a peer bridger and being a peer. Um, it, it really is in essence the same work. Um, I suppose you can call a lot of us peers case managers too. <laughs> um, I noticed uh, one person with a different agency, uh, their title was peer case manager. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, uh, the thing that I'm wondering, particularly as it, as it may apply to youth, is um, as a peer, I'm, I'm their advocate. I'm their full-time advocate. And uh, while I can share a story uh, in an attempt to direct them towards making appropriate choices, mm -hmm. what I found, and I'm working with uh, obviously much older clientele, but um, I need to support them in whatever decision they make. And a lot of them make the wrong decision. Um, in other words, you know, like choosing to continue using, um, I can try and tell a story that might get them to make a different decision, but I can't tell them to, or, you know, I just have to be their advocate full time. So, um, that's a problem I see with being a peer and not a case manager or having a different title, but as it applies to youth, there's a much much higher importance to steer people the right way and how as a peer can I just be an advocate without doing too much steering towards what I think is the an appropriate decision rather than just being their advocate for their decisions such that is it's such a good question that's such a good question and I think it might be one of the pieces that that we're all trying to navigate, right? So how do we get that engagement? How do we um, peer and not steer, right? And, and how do we be supportive in those spaces at the same time? So I'm, I'm lucky to be in a space where a lot of our youth are willing participants, right? They, their first night, they're like, man, I fucked up. Their second night, they're like, man, I fucked up, right? So I'm, I'm working with youth who are our captive audience, they're looking for change, they're looking for guidance. And, and, and in that space, the one thing that helps me, um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say steer, but, but what, the one thing that helps me peer is modeling, right? Uh, for me to model the, the processes that they either have gone through and how I navigated it, right? Or what they're going to go through or what a lot of us are currently going through at the same time, right? Now, I have limited experience because of my lived experience, if that makes sense, right? So as far as education, housing, employment, there are some things that when my you or, or when my peer that I'm connecting with has a need, a goal, a misunderstanding, I willingly and, and uh, eagerly dive into it in the boat with them. Like, man, let's figure this out together. And here, I'll sign up first to see what happens. And, um, you know, when I signed up, uh, question three was really weird. What, what, what did you uh, respond to? And things like that. So I think if you could, if you could think about how you can model that behavior that you're looking to get and get engagement and curiosity built around that. I think those are the, the key pieces to my engagement, right? And we all have our different approaches. Um, we all have different energy levels, personalities and ways that we connect. Um, but, but yeah, that is a really, really good question because we're all trying to figure that out. And with every peer that you work with, it'll be a little different, right? But um, I would just say, if you could try and model that behavior, even if you've gotten your license before, say, what's it look like now? Let's pull it up on your phone. It looks different on my phone. And I clicked yes. Did you click? Okay, cool, cool. All right. So just um, kind of getting in the boat with them is, has been my, has helped me in my success rate. Did that, was that helpful at all? I felt helped, Josh. I don't know if it counts. 
beautiful. Beautiful. Right? Wasn't that great? Um, so, oh, yes, Shelly, if you need more information about the peer role moving forward, the Operationalizing Peer Support webinar is October 18th, and it's exactly about this topic. So um, if you do need some um, assistance with that, you can email myself or Shelly Shore, um, and we will put the email invite, or we will email you an invite directly to it so that you have it. Um, so uh, by the end of this, I will make sure that you have everybody's email address on this call. Um, and so the only other thing I saw in there um, was uh, a question from George, but I feel like maybe, um, I, I guess, Josh, you could probably answer this. Can I go to Juvenile Hall to establish contact with clients who would need my assistance once they're released? I think that's what the peer bridgers do, right? Yes, yeah, so we're, we're contract, actually, I hate to say we're contracted. I oversee the contract for an agency that provides the peer bridgers, right? Now, currently we're in a pilot state status where we're serving King, Snohomish, and Pierce counties with a peer bridger. So that means our, our peer bridgers go into facilities and connect and say, who's from King, who's from Pierce, and who's from Snohomish? Everybody gather around. And we start to connect them to resources and connections into their in their communities, right? Uh, and sometimes because of our robust system, there's youth that don't eat anything, but they're just, they have gang affiliation. They're scribbling back in the community, right? But they have behavioral health meetings set up. They have their uh, inpatient, outpatient, they have everything aligned. But in order to get that engagement back into the community, there's, there's just something missing. So we've connected our youth with um, the Mayweather Boxing Academy, right? So they have something to focus on between the hours of 4.30, and 6 30 and can really have a community come around them and because i'm a peer with the gang affiliation i know under the the, the impact of having that community and why i reached out to the power groups or to the gangs right uh, because it was that community guys that would champion me for my achievements right and and that's what we want to provide we want to provide non-traditional uh we want to provide innovative approaches to community engagement, behavioral health, and mental health needs. And, and a lot of times it's been physical health or health. So uh, Patty Jo, I see your hand. Hi, thanks Joshua. So I really appreciate you um, sharing all this information and um, big shout out to all your efforts and great that this is a pilot. It brings me to a couple of things. And um, the thing that I noticed is that we're really doing a lot of peer um, development in, in different programs, different styles. But when you look at where the age groups are for the peers that are coming through the certified peer process, we're not really seeing a lot of folks that are really at the teenage levels pre-18, right? Where I think yeah. that, that would be a real benefit. And so we're in a rural county down here in Grace Harbor County and then Pierce County, and um, I mean, Pacific County. And, um, you know, there's not like, traditional gang affiliations like you're talking about. However, there is that um, social behavior that mm -hmm. is here. And yeah. so it's different though. And there's a real need for that type of support because we know that there's a real gap for those folks that are about age 15 to up to age 24, like you were saying, you know? And um, I'm just curious in your pilot, have you, did you discuss before you launched the pilot um, some of those those needs to to you know because I do see the real difference in all the different peer level um, titles and your peer bridger is a is a perfect title I think I think it really helps because you're really shepherding that person through the system you know you're holding their hand because you know basically at that age group you know before where we are today in what you would used to be called a normal family your parent or your older sibling would be that person shepherding you through, right? So most of these people are coming out and they don't have that in their family. And so the family is still broken too. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different levels. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, two things. A, the age range of peers. Um, it's my understanding, now this could have changed or it could be the same, that to become a certified peer counselor, you have to be age 18, right? To take the state test, you have to be age 18. However, in juvenile rehabilitative settings, I am connected with some awesome certified peer counselor trainings 
that come into our facility and provide the 36 hour certified peer counselor training to our youth. So currently, right now, we are churning out young, vibrant, certified peer counselors with lived experience and an understanding of the system, right? And our, some of them are just waiting for the day that they can take that certified peer counselor, the, the state test, right? Now, um, the second thing about that is peer workforce development is super high on what on my to-do list. I got to think about what's going to happen in the next two years, three years, and 10 years. What are our hires going to look like? What are our hiring practices going to look like, right? Who are we bringing in to do the work? And just in the short time, I've only been in this position about six months, killing it, right? But in the short time, I've realized the power of proper peer pairing, right? And a lot of us might go, Ooh, what's that mean, right? But to understand how traditional peering works, right? I might connect really, really well with uh, Benjamin, right? I might connect really, really well with um, just historically, who, who do you remember connecting with when you were a team? Um, and using that those data points as ways to move forward, right? And I say that to say, um, there's also inappropriate peer pairing, right? And we can say our training is there, we can say our skills are there, but when you put individuals with uh, behavioral health needs, right, um, with mental health needs, uh, who are currently ex going through the process of juvenile rehabilitation, right, we want to protect them. We want to uh, we want to guide them the best possible. And and for instance, peering a, a young fifteen year old vulnerable female with, uh, you know, the only peer in the state, myself. We could, I could go into these rooms and I could peer, I could peer, I could peer, but because of all the behavioral health needs that we both have, knowing that Amanda Polly might be a better fit, might be a better fit to peer with that youth is, is just data. It's stuff that we need to know as far as moving this work forward. And it's definitely a cringe point, like, ooh, because I understand I could peer young women. I could, I could peer young men. I know women can peer uh, young men. But because of the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Because of the settings that we're in. Yeah, because there's just so many restraints because of because being a minor and an adult. Yes, and, and yeah, that's absolutely. that's really that's really what I was getting at is that um, there's such a need for those peers to have another minor be their peer, and and it's interesting because I've brought this up at a couple of meetings and with some you know, um, leaders mm -hmm. from, from our school, so, you know, from our OSPI, you know, and it's interesting the responses that I would get because, you know, you got all these different agents, state agencies, and I came from Department of Health. I worked there for a really long time, and now I'm in a bit mental behavioral health um, facility, that, you know, clinic that I work for, and, right. um, but that the school OSPI level agency had a different perception of what say DOH, healthcare authority, and folks had, right? And, yeah. and I think there's a real disconnect there because that is still today a current challenge to overcome because we, we the, the response that I would get is they're not mature enough to be able to guide one another when I think that is a complete false statement or fact. Yes. It's not yeah. factual in my opinion. You know, I, I feel I, that- I absolutely you, agree with you um, because I, they're not too young to lead them to gangbang. They're right. not too young to lead them to, you, you, I, I, I want to just preface what you're saying with this quick story. The first person to ever tell me to say, say yes, ma'am, and open the door and uh, get people's buy-in in the community. And, and that means saying, good morning, Gene, and, and how you doing, Jim, and uh, mowing lawns every chance I get, was the person who jumped me into my game, right? So... That person understood the power of community. They understood the, the power of uh, interpersonal connections, right? And uh, they didn't understand leadership, right? They wanted to lead, right? But they didn't understand leadership. And I think that's what our certified peer counselor trainings and all the other trainings that we have in our systems, they really uh, provide is that understanding of the power 
of your position in, in line, uh, your, your peer position, right? How you can get someone to say, yo, this is really cool. Let's try this out. You can, at the, in the same breath, do it to something positive and uplift and, and create positive traction in your community. And that was something that, that has stuck in, that stuck with me uh, really close since I've gotten my certified career counselor training is, is there's power in that, you know? So, man, I went way off track, I'm sorry. But yes, okay. workforce development. But you're getting, you're getting to what I was asking for. So that's good. You're, it's in, it's in your, your, your lens. It's not in the, the specific scope of the pilot that you're doing. Um, another thing that I was thinking of is um, your way of delivering this message is very relatable and very youth relatable, I believe. I appreciate that. And, and it reminds me of many years ago and when I was still a parent and my kids were still in school, the Elma High School did a um, program through Oprah Winfrey of all things. And it was something about like the angels or something. I can't remember. It was this big production where they came to the school for two days and we were just in the gymnasium and big areas. And there was only like a hundred students for those two days. And, and as parents were really, um, we were drilled with questions before we could um, volunteer. Right. And it was a complete safe zone and we were paired up with youth and then the youth talked with one another and we were just, as a parent, we were just there to guide them to make sure that they didn't um, give each other the wrong type of guidance, right? You yes. know, because there's, you still need that at that different level, like you're saying. And I feel like what you're saying and how you're presenting it, it would be really cool if you could just like do like a road trip, you know, and just like do some touring and coming to the different counties and sharing the story and your experiences this way, because I feel that the more that we're sharing it, then we're actually breaking down the stigma because in rural communities, it is status quo. You don't talk, you don't share. If your youth is having difficulties, you just don't announce it. Yeah. And you don't come yeah. out. And that is another level that's just a real challenge still. Yeah, and I, I understand those challenges. Um, and, and it's funny because I come from a rural town where the farmers children were the gang members right and and so I was in a rural town I had gang affiliations I had to get rides everywhere because there was no bus system things like that so it was uh it was interesting but it was my experience you know uh it might not be everyone's experience but but to bring those skills and that understanding with me into these spaces right and into these different towns and to go on tours and say this is why it's important to not only myself, but for the community, for us to have these conversations, right? Because it's happening in our rural towns. It's, it's just not being talked about, right? And it's not being shared. It's not being brought to light. And the re more importantly, the resources aren't being brought into those communities in order to make a change, right? That's, that's, where the, that's what happens after the conversations, right? We want action items, right? So if, if there's no Boys and Girls Club if there is a Boys and Girls Club, there's probably transportation issues. If there's transportation, is there going to be food there, right? So thinking about ways to get my kid to say, uh -huh, let's go do that, right? And come with me, G. Let's, let's go to the YMCA, get some free food, and maybe we'll play basketball, right? So to be able to give these opportunities to our underserved and rural communities is, is super key, too. So that's why I need all of you guys all the time in all the work that we do. So I wanted to add, Josh, just so um, everybody knows that uh, actually uh, at the end of this month, I will be doing four presentations at Aberdeen High School um, about peer support and um, what that's going to look like if they decided they wanted to become a peer supporter. Um, and so there it is some of the smaller places who are struggling with a lot of these exact same um, challenges um, are reaching out and asking. I completely agree with everything that was said. Um, I do want you to know, though, I really have full faith that do, starting this um, for career day at school is going to be a really fantastic way of having those 18-year-old peers, certified peers, and making sure that their voice is heard in those communities from their personal experience like Josh is giving us now. And so I feel like um, you keep uh, blowing the horn, Patty. Um, we want all of that really good um, information that you gave us at state level, especially so that we can make sure that any effect we can change, we are. 
So if we if we wanted to do a request, Amanda, um, I'm I'm assuming that possibly Harbor Strong reached out to you. Um, yes. Wait. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um. Hold on. I will hey. tell you. It's um. It's Aberdeen High School's um. Uh, peer. It's like a. I guess it's like a career peering forward or look forward oh. career future day or something like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So maybe they're count they're counselors. But I guess my thing is um. I think it would be really good to be able to have, you know, to have Josh come down. I've not heard you talk. I, I feel like you would do well. I just, Josh was experienced in talking about coming from a rural community, you know, um, I think he would relate to the young men yeah. that are here in the rural counties really well. And um, because he's, you know, I don't know, Josh, if you're from Grace Harbor County or Pacific County, but because you're not necessarily, um, you know, maybe you are, I don't know, but if you, either way, you're welcome to come because you're will, you're willing to share your story and you're not, you know, there's no shame, you know, you walk with pride and that's what something is needed in these rural communities because we still have that shaming from mm -hmm. my own generation of, you know, you just can't talk about it amongst the adults, you know, yeah. although we all yeah. know whose youth have had issues and troubles, we just don't talk about it because then you're just, you know, whatever. But um, I think it would be really cool. So I will, um, I, if we wanted to do a request for y'all, could we do that? Just send it to either one of you or something? Absolutely. I will um, leave you guys with my contact information so uh -huh. you guys can reach out, you guys, we can connect, we can do all the things and uh, just make sure that we uplift what we're doing in, in our state and in our communities, right? Would so, there be a fee? No, no fees. Yeehaw. I'm pulling up. <laughs> Yeah, right, we, thanks, we don't charge for awesomeness. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Um, well, we have um, a, a Sarah White and I are um, uh, facilitating a meeting next week with the Grace Harbor Consortium. And I think this is definitely a topic that we'll bring forward and so um, put out there and see what the um, membership has to say about it and see if we Absolutely. can get some action. I'm on board. I'm on board. This is what we do, right? And uh, my, my email tagline is now go back and find all the little use that you can or whatever it says. But, right. but yes, that's what we do is, is we look at that next generation. We look at the workforce development piece and how the people behind me are going to come in and, and make that change. So absolutely, yeah, it's, it's, it. it's like the only way to break the generational cycle and then to get rid of the, the burden of, so of the adult world. I mean, there's just not enough support services. It's because we're flooding them. We have to stop the flood. We got to build a little bit of a dam, I guess. Slow yeah. it down and educate. There's Slow it down gonna, and educate. I'd yeah, there's, that you said <laughs> they're still gonna they're still gonna experiment and make mistakes because we're human beings. But if we can slow it down a little bit, I think it'll be great. Absolutely, absolutely. So good. Yes, I can see we have a lot to to go over in our next meeting. We're gonna have Patty Joe. <laughs> have fun. Sweet. So am I, what are we at like time? Did I take up more than my time? No, no, you actually technically have 25 minutes left, which is amazing. Um, and there's some really great, um, Sarah White had some really beautiful things to say um, in the chat box. Um, Sarah, I'm gonna go ahead and read this out. Uh, so she said, we had a behavioral health gap analysis just performed for our county. And we had a group of youth, 18 years old, interested and in stating that they wish that there were programs where you could provide peer services or peer support when we, and I guess she said, and when we told them about the CBC process, they had no idea it was something that they could do. So I think that it's going to be a really, when I hear that, I hear market, 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 market conversations, yes. you know, uh, career days, career fair days, um, going to the fair and saying, hey, I heard you guys are singing here today. You know, um, that was a straight rural commentary to the singing at the <laughs> county fair. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so the CPC role is not talked much about in rural communities. And I completely agree. Um, I started out as a CPC in Wenatchee. So, um, and this is where I was licensed. This is where I did all of my direct service experience. And though it's large, Chelan Douglas County is ginormous and very spread out. And so I, um, I can relate a lot to that. Uh, it's, um, people are like, what's a peer? <laughs> yeah, so it, yeah. Yeah. My, my first move, the, my first big check that I, that I spent at DCYF was for a commercial. I said, we need a commercial guys. Yeah. And 
the commercial turned out wonderful. But the idea for me, uh, because of, you know, I started out as like a rapper and then I did a, a record company and then I did all the other things where I had to understand what networking was like and, and like how to naturally grow something, right? And that was before things were going viral. I'm, I'm almost 40, so, you know, the internet thing wasn't my friend. So um, I, I say that to say, um, damn, I lost what I was saying, but it was going to be so good. It was going to be so good. <laughs> you were talking about um, uh, doing the commercials and marketing. <laughs> yes, yes, marketing, dissemination of information, right? And understanding that, uh, that the generation that we want to bring in is not reading one pages, right? They're not reading emails per se. They're not, they're not reading uh, uh, the grants or RFPs that are available for them, right? So to be able to disseminate information in a way that is culturally responsive to the youth that we're trying to bring in is super important. So yes, there's a lot of information out there about peer support, but it's not delivered in a way that our youth have access to it, right? It's not in their TikToks. It's not in their Instagrams and in their phones. It's not a part of their everyday processes that they're doing. And I think that's going to be the very next step that we need to look at as far as like, how do we outreach? How do we get information out there? How do we connect and engage the youth? And we're going, we're fighting against this thing every single day. And we see our youth like this, right? We need to get in there. We need them to see us in here, right? And instead of going against those things, understand to dive in is the key, right? Um, here's an example I use often when I'm talking to staff about that dissemination of information. Uh, China, their TikTok algorithm is championship games, kids winning chess matches, science projects. When they're scrolling, they're getting information. It's still giving the same uh, um, effect, like, oh, oh, I'm scrolling, and oh, I'm still connecting, and oh, my friend commented, and oh, my friend liked, it's still doing all the things, but it's education, it's purposeful, it's intentional, and I think that's how we need to approach our system as well, and understanding that we can't fight it. Education is coming in, and it's creating a bigger and bigger space in our homes, and if we're going to impact the youth that we're trying to impact, we need to get in that phone. So. Plus, TikTok is so awesome. We could have so much fun. There might be a, there might be a flash mob at the Pure Pathways conference next year. So it's oh, worthy okay. to come. Hey. Yeah, we're going to give you a call, Josh. <laughs> Let's go, that's what I'm talking about. That's what we need. And then we'll be all over TikTok, see? Right. And my then plan. Be like, oh my gosh, peer support is the biggest rave and we <laughs> want to do it through this. Agency. Yes, exactly. Sweet. So I wanted to kind of give you guys this quick breakdown of, of our peer bridger support services, peer to peer connection. So it's super simple. Our staff identify and enroll their, their candidates. Right. Um, I got a bunch of stuff over my screen. So I'm trying to see through it at the same time. And there we are. Um, we focus on instrumental, emotional, informational, affi and affiliational connections, right? These are things that, that we really want to focus on. Uh, I have here our pilot program of serving youth and young adults re-entering into Snohomish, King, and Pierce counties, just so we can get a visual of, okay, that's where the peer bridging pilot program is happening. Um, and then, so boom, we do an orientation and enrollment to break down what peer bridger services is, what to expect, and then sign the dotted line so we can do the work. Step three is going to be, we, we connect the youth with the peer bridger themselves. So the peer bridger comes in and says, hi, I'm Jimmy. And some of my lived experience is similar to, or however Jimmy's approach is to making that connection, right? And then um, there's that engaging in peer support piece. So it's a quick process. This is something that I needed to create. So my staff understood like, what is peer bridging? And what's the flow chart to it? And things like that. And uh, and just generally helping them understand the process to that. And uh, peer support referral process, boom, easy. Yeah, so we kind of went through the things. And uh, of course, we killed it per usual. <laughs> on the side of the road. 
So are I, there any points? I love that you did this on the side of the road. In fact, I think right. I know exactly where you're at, which is kind of um, disconcerting. So please be careful. <laughs> yes, yes. Very careful as always. I'm headed to a, uh, a, a, a training and presentation in one's in Yakima and one's in Kennewick. And then I'll be headed back to Olympia area. But yeah, just spreading the word, um, making sure they see my peer shirt, P for peer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, getting that buy-in, getting that buy-in, getting that understanding. I see a hand raise. Let's go, Peter. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Very, very informative. Um, I'm curious how long this pilot program is, is geared to be, um, because I can see this kind of thing working you know, if it works in, in the juvenile detention space, I can imagine it would also work in um, in, a, in the hospital setting and in inpatient services where people are a lot of the time going back to particularly state hospitals to, uh, you know, keep, you know, it's the same idea, right? You're in yes. this kind of facility, right? So I'm wondering what, what how long we have to wait until we can see if this is really working. Oh my gosh, listen, this could be such a good part. My brain's exploding. I love that you said that because peer bridging in juvenile facilities is actually modeled from that same space that you're talking about. Right. So, so peer bridgers started working like in Western State Hospital and yeah. in Eastern State Hospital. And I don't know all the history about it, but that's definitely where it started. So your, your head is in the exact right space, right? And, and how can we bring peer bridgers everywhere in all of our institutions there's data behind it there's um there's trainers that can come in and train your staff and there's funding for it right there's an understanding for the need for peer bridgers and all of our behavioral health mental health spaces um so yeah you are you're dead on with that and um just to answer the question, our pilot program is a 12-month program. They're going to serve the, all the youth that they have, uh, that they can in that time. We're going to turn in our data and say, this is, you know, this is the data. And hopefully that data can reflect in the recidivism rate numbers. Right. That's, that's where we want to see our work is in the recidivism rates, right? Yeah. If the youth that we connected with had less recidivism, and that's when we know we've been successful. Um so 12 month pilot prop, uh, for the peer bridger. Now, I'd like to also preface that by saying I'm also going to, around to all of our agencies and our and building partnerships and building relationships to see what other peer support programs are available that aren't in those pilot areas because we have youth releasing to all those areas, right? A lot of them are resource deserts. And then what can we do in those resource deserts? Like say with the Mayweather Boxing Academy, to get their buy-in to A, work with our youth, but B, maybe look at some behavioral health trainings and see how you can infuse the two, knowing that you are the go-to place in your area, right? And how could you have peers that are also boxing coaches, right? So getting getting those conversations to happen in places that are resource deserts is, is like my favorite part, so. To, to add to that too, um it's a really great opportunity for things like 4-H to happen um, if you're in rural communities. Um, I, I know that sounds a little, a little hokey sometimes, but um, having something to care about that, can, that isn't always directly coming out of your pocket and then show your animal and then get prizes for your animal and then they buy your animal. It's, you know, it's a really, it's a really great opportunity. It's like knitting long-term. You get to see something beautiful come to life underneath your hands. And um, it really gives individuals, whether they're young or not, an opportunity to um, value a life that isn't just their own. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's therapeutic. I love that you said that because I'm going to share one more thing with you. And let me get back to Zoom really quick. Go to share. And boom, I agree a thousand percent. Check us out. I understand the impact of, of caring for animals, of working with animals. And um, I, I, I wrote a couple bull. I've seen a couple head of bull in my time, right? This is for a, uh, a different presentation that I have later, but you know, about giving opportunities and experiences and starting with the home and then 
branching out or working with your community and, and really providing those experiences from that peer perspective. But but yes, you're, you're dead right on that. Go ahead, Patty. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk over your hand. No, that's okay. Because just as Amanda said that I was going to share that I'm so part of a grant that we had um, that's it, now ended from HRSA, we did a pilot program and I initiated that with WSU Extension Office down here in Grace Harbor County. And nice. it's called the check, the, the 4-H check change program. It's a national program. And so what we did, it wasn't anything to do with your traditional 4-H world, meaning, you know, horses, animals and stuff. But we had a group of um, young um early adults, however you want to call it, um, folks that were, you know, in high school, uh, sophomore, junior, and seniors, and they actually taught, they developed with um, the WSU um, rural medical program, they developed a um, curriculum to teach, and because it was COVID, we didn't get to open the classroom, so we had to scramble and, and um, improvise and teach it through a webinar. We had to teach, they taught digital literacy, to wow. adults right because like they were saying they couldn't understand that you know there was we did a documentary and and one of the men in the documentary Richard you know he said he goes when I came out of prison there were cell phones how the hell do you use a cell phone I don't yes. even know what it is right they went in when we still had a quarter to put in the the pay mm -hmm. so these these young group of um youth develop these this program and now WSU is going to continue to sh um, shepherd this along and continue to do this they taught basic um outlook you know how to do an email what is email etiquette how to build um, a word document and make your resume and it was a lot of adults that were in recovery and so when we did like a debriefing is what what did you all get out of this from the youth's words and view and it was the the most aha moment was one of the young people who said you know 4.0 gpa ultra achiever um did a lot of really good things all the way through school and stuff but worked really hard to get it said that they didn't feel alone they felt that it was normal their household because in their household when they would go home daddy was an alcoholic uncle and aunt were still living there and there was drug and alcohol being used there there was other abuses that were going on but when they would leave and go to school, they you would never know it. Yeah. And so when they were treating um, this program, they they saw it as an extracurriculum thing that would look good on their um, uh, college application, right? Which no doubt it does. But the outcome of it was so impactful because they understood that they're not alone. They understood that it's 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 a norm to have. A dysfunctional family i guess if you want to say it that way right so it was pretty cool so um, the check change program it is huge um and they've done a really a lot of things so if you wanted to branch out and kind of look into that for your guys program um i would definitely connect with the director down here at the grace harbor extension how exciting yes absolutely you know, i'm gonna first like connecting with you guys a lot <laughs> oh, Joshua, i got a question yes Oh uh, yeah. Okay. How do I connect with a juvenile hall so I could, I, you know, I guess I, a contract or what have you, so I could go go in to help out the youth. I guess for building and all that. I so that is my job is to go out into our community and find the partners, find the peer programs, find the peer support, find where you serve because uh, where are you located? Uh, I'm in Mount Vernon, Washington. Okay, perfect. So that's where we would want to connect you to our youth, either in the facilities up near you or releasing into your community, right? We want our youth to have peer support everywhere. And it takes individuals like yourself um, contracting with us to make it happen. So I, I, I'm i putting my email in the chat. Um, please, everyone, email me if you would like to talk about next steps in working with juvenile rehabilitation um, or DCYF, but um, my realm is peer support and juvenile rehabilitation. If you want to talk about something other than that, I can totally shuffle you to the right people, but but that's my job is to bring in the dope stuff. So absolutely, George, please. Yeah, I'd like to get that started here, Mom Vernon. Thank you. 
Beautiful. So joshua.smith.dcyf.wa.gov. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that was right before I send it out. I'll make sure too that um, any attachments that Josh wants to share will be sent through to me and I will make sure everybody on this call receives um, uh, not just, uh, not just Josh's amazing information and his email will be attached to that as well in the CC piece, but, um, we'll also be, um, adding in the link, um, asking for some feedback if you have it and, um, making sure that, uh, you have, um, you have our emails as well. So if you need yes. to get a hold of us for anything, and if, um, you really want to do that community connecting, let's get her done. I'm so excited. <laughs> How exciting. We did that, guys. I think uh yeah, I think we killed that that hour, knocked it out. Heck yeah, I'm totally impressed. If I could give you a high, I probably could drive over and give you a high five really quick. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you come back through Wenatchee, you have to let me know, Josh. We can have a cup of coffee. Um absolutely. All right, y'all. Uh Thank you so much, so, so, so much, Josh, for um, coming and spending your time here with us, giving us all of this wonderful information and sharing your talent um, and your passion with our Peer Blend. Um, so uh, next month uh, is uh, still a little bit of a surprise right now, but we may be talking to um, Northwest Credible Messenger about the wonderful work they're doing in our communities, especially um, you know, uplifting in that um, with our uh, a proviso that we're working on right now in order to help individuals who um, are underrepresented get that representation through peer support. Yes. And so um, a part of our workforce development as well. So um, I'm going to a Northwest Credible Messengers presentation right now. Oh, that's amazing. The 40 hour one, right? Yes, but I'm just coming in to give a presentation about my lived experience. <laughs> that's great. No, that's beautiful. I'm really excited. Um, so we hope to see everybody next week, um, if or next month, excuse me. And if you are going to the uh, the COD conference in Yakima, we'll see you there too. So make sure you swing mm -hmm. on by and say hello at our table. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and end this meeting. One last time, everybody rocks. Thanks, folks. I really appreciate you. Don't hesitate to reach out to Josh, Shelly, or myself, and we'll do everything we possibly can to facilitate um, your needs. So thanks again, Washington. I'm super proud to know you. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Drive safe, Josh. Thank you. Absolutely. Good job, soon. Josh. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> Drive safe. Yes. I'm a Laker fan, too. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>